Okay. All right, all right. Let's get started. All right, all right. Settle down, settle down, settle down. Okay, all right. Let's talk a little bit about housekeeping because we have a celebration of learning coming up, so I want everybody to be aware of what's going on. So the celebration is going to be on Tuesday. What the? Um, well, I do have party favors that I'm bringing. <laughs> no, 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 it is not. By party favors, I meant the exams. So, uh, okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit about homework submission. So obviously, homework one is graded and returned. Homework two is currently being graded because we moved the exam up. We got homework two and homework three sort of back to back. So the TA is still working on homework two, and obviously the TA couldn't grade homework three because you just turned it in. So uh, what I've done is I posted the solution for homework two and homework three. Homework two's been up, I think, for a day. Homework three, I literally just posted it about 30 seconds ago. So uh, I've got everybody's homework three. Uh, hopefully, uh, because uh, the solution's been posted, can't really accept late assignments because you've got the answer. So does anybody have any questions on the uh, homework grading scenario and whatnot? Um, like I said, uh, we're going to try and get the, uh, the actual assignments graded as soon as possible. My plan is once we get stuff graded, I mean, I'll be honest, it might be you know, the day before the exam, it might be the day of the exam, but as, literally as soon as, as I get them back, they're going on my cart, you all can come and pick them up whenever, okay? So does that sound all right? And then, like I said, in the meantime, you've got the solutions and everything to, uh, to go through. Sound good? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the celebration coming up. So um, what I'd like to do today is I want you to understand, um, you know, the format of the exam. I don't want you to come in and think, like, okay, what's this exam going to be like? You know, what types of questions are, uh, am I going to get asked? So uh, that type of stuff I really want to assuage as best I can. Um, so let me just sort of get into it. Okay, so let's talk about the exam. So first off, the exam is closed book and closed notes. First off, if you've ever had me for class before, you're going to find these these formats are, are pretty uh, uh, pretty similar uh, or pretty familiar. Um, so you can use a calculator uh, and a formula sheet. Now on your formula sheet, I have you all make your own formula sheet. Um, usually, um, what what I have found is that by making your own formula you're essentially studying, you know, and you'd be surprised uh, how many times in classes like this you make the formula sheet, and then when you're actually taking the test, you don't even look at it, because by making a formula sheet and by actually physically writing stuff down, you're forcing your brain to remember uh, this stuff a little better, um, so, so you end up not really needing it. Now, you can put whatever you want on the formula sheet. You can put methods, you can put definitions, you can put formulas. You can put whatever you want. The only thing I have if you don't put on your formula sheet are worked out examples. And that's not really for my benefit. It's actually more for yours. Um, and, and I don't know if it's so much, so much the case with this class, but definitely for a case like, for instance, like structural analysis. You know, you're doing a, uh, let's say, a, a trust problem on the exam, and the, the, the diagonal members are at a three to four slope ratio, but the example you put on your formula sheet's at a one to one, and now you're screwing up and using the wrong slope ratios. I, I can't tell you how many times this stuff like that happened. So for your sake, not really so much for mine, you put whatever you want, just no full-blown worked out examples. Okay? Now try to be on time. We are starting the exam at 12.30 p.m. sharp. If I've got every single person in the room here earlier, we'll start earlier. I don't have a problem with that. But everybody's going to be here. So try, at very least try and be on time. Um, scratch paper, uh, any necessary that are graphs, you know, if you need a sividence chart or a blending chart or something like that, that's all going to be there. You're not going to need to uh, uh, put that on there. Anything that's tabulated uh, and whatnot, you wouldn't need to uh, bring that or put that on your formula sheet. That stuff would be provided. But we'll have scratch stapler or a scratch paper. We'll have a stapler uh, and all of that. It's probably a good idea to have a straight edge with you. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, if that hasn't been a, a theme with this class, uh, it should be. Make sure that you bring a straight edge with you. Um, Everybody okay on just fundamental 30,000 foot view, 30,000 foot level stuff? Everybody okay with that? Okay, now here's the format of the exam. And I went ahead and put this little box here to specifically delineate 
what we're covering on the exam. Uh, so lecture notes one through two, so the introductory concepts, the aggregate stuff, all of that's going to be covered on the exam. Uh, the homework assignments, it's all the stuff that was covered in homeworks one through three. And I went ahead and put labs one through four uh, just because you know, we did sort of discuss that stuff. I mean, a lot of the stuff we discussed, uh, discussed in lecture is stuff that we did in the lab, so I figure it's probably a good idea to at least cover that stuff uh, as well. Now, if you've never had me for class before, you'll find that, that my uh, uh, exam format that I tend to use is pretty much the same format I use in just about every class I, I teach. Um, so, so that you're aware of the exam format, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, there's going to be four problems on the exam. Okay? Now, th that might seem a little deceptive, but let me just uh, go into it. So problem one is going to be a set of short answers. So there'll be maybe something like half a dozen short answer uh, uh, problems. And when I say short answer, I mean if you're writing more than like five words for some of these problems, you're doing something wrong. Like when I say short answer, I mean short answer, okay? So problem one is going to be a set of short answer conceptual questions. No math, no anything like that, just making sure that you understand fundamental concepts, you know, terms, definitions, things like that. So problem one is going to be a set of those questions, and then there's going to be three computation-based problems. So problem one is just short answer conceptual stuff. Problems two through four, those are actually calculation problems. Uh, one other thing I will mention, um, uh, one of the things that I do my best to avoid when my, I make an exam, I'm not one to make an exam that is uh, a significant time cruncher, as I call it. I'm not the one, I don't like to make four-hour exams, give you 50 minutes to take it. That's not really my, um, my mode. Folks that have had me for class before, I think will we'll tell you that that's not really what I do. Um, what I did, uh, what I, a rule that I typically try and follow when I make an exam is I tend to follow a rule of three. So for instance, this is a 75 minute exam, so I better be able to do it in 25 minutes. I, I, I take the time divided by three, and if I can finish it in 25 minutes, you should be able to do it in 75 minutes. I timed myself, and I was able to finish it in 19 minutes. So this should not be, it should not be a, um, uh, so much of a, a time cruncher. You should be fine on time, okay? In fact, the timing was actually how I figured out how much each problem was worth. I actually just timed each problem. Whichever one took the longest was the one that was worth more. So I figured that was a pretty easy, straightforward way of doing that. Which that's another thing, the problems are weighted. So, you know, I mean, for instance, the conceptual questions, like some of them might be worth two or three points. Don't spend 50 minutes on a three-point problem, you know. Maybe spend, you know, more time on the ones that are worth 30 points or, or something like that. So it's just basic stuff. I have a feeling everybody uh, understands all this. Uh, let's talk about concepts. So like I said, there's really two big concepts, uh, two big, big uh, uh, lecture items that are going to be reviewed on this exam. So uh, first off, the introductory stuff. Make sure you can identify common civil engineering materials and selection considerations, things like economy, desirable properties, aesthetics, and stuff like that. Make sure that you can compute, and, and I'll say basic stresses and strains and deflections, you know, basic loading scenarios. Nothing torsion. This isn't Engineering 216, so no torsion, no beam deflection stuff or anything like that. Just P over A, you know, change in length over the original, like basic stuff. Um, make sure you can identify regions of interest uh, and fundamental properties on a representative stress-strain curve. Uh, so you, what is the elastic modulus? What's the yield stress? What's the tensile strength? Uh, what are the plastic regions of the curve, necking regions, stuff like that. Just make sure you, you uh, understand that. I'll be able to describe additional uh, material behaviors and concepts. You know, what is the Poisson's effect? What is, what is viscoelastic behavior, um, fatigue, factors of safety, stuff like that. I mean, this list isn't exhaustive, but it gives you kind of a general idea of what's going to be covered on the exam. Um, be able to identify direct and indirect laboratory measurement devices. And remember, we talked about direct devices. Like, like rulers and whatnot, and then there's indirect devices like strain gauges and stuff like that. Make sure you can identify that. Uh, be able to compute basic mean and standard deviations. Yes, sir? Is this online? Yes. Yes, it is. It's in the lecture notes section. It's, so there's like lecture notes zero, which was the, the course overview stuff, lecture notes one, lecture notes two, and then there's this, and then it goes into cement. So, yeah, this is online. Um, at least it should be. Did anybody, has anybody checked to see? It is on there? Okay, all right, good. I know I can upload it, but I'm my, I, I'll be the first person to admit that I could have forgotten 
to turn it on. So. Okay. And lastly, be able to compute means and standard deviations. Just tip, you know, pretty basic stuff. Okay. Aggregates. Um, like I said, this list isn't exhaustive, but I think this sort of covers the big overarching stuff. So make sure you can describe sources and general uses of aggregates in civil engineering applications. Be able to define what are fundamental properties and parameters. What's the maximum aggregate size? What's the nominal maximum aggregate size? Uh, what's a coarse aggregate versus a fine aggregate? What are some important mechanical and non-mechanical properties of aggregates? What are the four key moisture states uh, of aggregates? And what are the associated moisture content or water content values associated with that? Make sure you can compute specific gravities and unit weights of representative aggregate samples. Uh, obviously, a big one is being able to perform a sieve analysis. So be able to uh, make sure you can plot the results and compare it against uh, uh, required specifications. Be able to compute the fineness modulus of, of a given fine aggregate. Uh, pretty basic stuff. And also make sure that you can blend two aggregates together to meet specifications and that you can compute the composite properties of a blend. So if you got a blend, what is the angularity of that blend? What's the specific gravity of that blend, uh, et cetera? So um, that, in a nutshell, that's the exam. Okay, that's the the um, the, the topics that are going to be covered on the exam. Now, so I would say that's part one of our exam one review, which is me coming up here and giving you the hey, here it is on what's going to be covered on the exam. Now, part two. Part two is where I sort of shut up with my lecture and let you all ask whatever questions you want. You can ask me what the answer to problem one is. I'm not telling you, but you can ask whatever you want, okay? But the point is to make sure that you all feel comfortable with what's going on with the exam. I, I don't want you all to worry about, you know, you know, nitpicky stuff like, well, is, you know, is this how this question is going to be going and so forth. I really just want to make sure that you all understand the concepts and I want the, you know, the, the detail associated stuff I want you to be relaxed with. So if there's any questions and whatnot, I now turn the floor over to you. Yes, sir. Were there any sort of studies before this and MRT and any others? Uh, that's a good question. Are there, are there certain formulas that are more important than others? I don't know that the, the answer to that question is yes. Um, I will say this and I, this is going to be a somewhat cryptic answer, but if you have used the formula, I would throw it on there. I mean, there, there are some formulas, like, like here's a for instance. I, I threw a formula on there uh, in, in the aggregate lecture notes in regards to the abrasion test. Remember how you have an aggregate and they throw it in the big drum and put the big you know, steel spheres in the drum and then so you have the before and after loss. I had a formula on there. I would not worry about that because we never used it, either in an example problem or on a homework assignment. So if you want a simple answer, it's if you used it, throw it on there. But um, beyond that, I, I don't really know that I can point to one specific formula versus another. As an, as an addition to that, now that I'm talking about it, what I would also say is, um, uh, like for instance, sieve analyses. We really didn't have formulas wrote down for sieve analyses, we just had a process. If there are, if, if you want to create some formulas on your formula sheet to make that process a little easier, I'd add that as well. Is that, does that kind of answer your question? Simple, simple uh, uh, litmus test is if you used it, put it on there, so. Yes, sir. Um, that's a good question. So is it going to be SI units or US units? Um, I'll say this. There's going to be, there's probably going to be a little bit of back and forth, but there's also instances where it doesn't really matter. Like, for instance, if you're in the lab, let's say, and, and this, this is a formula I think of. So if you recall, remember how we computed uh, specific gravities? And you're essentially taking weights divided by weights. It really didn't matter if they were in grams or pounds. It was all the same thing. Do you see what I mean? So, um, so yeah. So there will. I, I would expect a little bit of bleed over. Um, maybe also if you're dealing with stresses, it's probably a good idea to throw your stress conversions. Remember the over millimeter squared and stuff like that. But don't expect any unit gymnastics. 
So as far as the sieve analysis, right. Well, that must be mean. Well, we have to know like 4.75 millimeters is one to four, I think. No. Okay. No. That 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 type of stuff is what I consider to be stuff you can look up and and you could even Google that stuff. I'm more, more interested in your ability to conduct the process, be it, you know, conduct the process of a sieve analysis or a blend or, or, or what have you. I'm not really, I'm not the biggest on memorization because, I mean, some values I think you need to m memorize by the time you get out of here. If you don't know that the unit weight of water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, by the time you got a civil engineering degree, well, it's like, come on. But I, I don't expect that you know the millimeter size of a number 140 sieve. I can't remember that, and I don't think really think it's necessary. That's what specs and tables and you know resources like Google are for. So, what what I'm interested in is that you understand the mechanics and the process. So. Yes, sir. Um, like, do you have something specific? Let me say that. Let me say Um. No, I, I'm not really worried about that because, again, that just goes to if you've got the standard, you can just read it. Um, I'll also say this: I am not going to say, "Okay, tell me the title of ASTM C33." Go. Yeah. I'm not doing that either. I, I don't think that's that. I mean, if you wasted your time studying that stuff, that's what a table of contents is for. Just just look it up. You know. Um, what you need to understand is, given the data and given the properties, how do I perform, you know, engineering analysis? How do I perform engineering design? Memorizing the title of ASTM C33, I'm, that's not engineering to me. Engineering to me is being able to assess the data and, and make decisions and, and perform associated computations. So I'm, I'm not worried about stuff like that. Now, now, let me also let me qualify that though by saying this. Um, for instance. The specific gravity calcs I mentioned earlier, you know, where it's like uh, uh, A divided by B minus C and then B divided by B minus C, that came from an ASTM spec. So we were doing calculations associated with an ASTM spec. And those I do expect you to know how to do, but those are, I mean, that just goes along with the computations and the methods that we're learning in the class in general. So I'm not, I'm not focused on that memorization stuff, just that you can perform the computations. Did I answer your question? And everybody else okay with that? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 That is exactly right. And uh, to, to clarify, by using cumulative percent retained, it doesn't matter if there's sieves in between or sieves above or sieves below, because cumulatively, that that's what you're accounting for. Okay. So that that doesn't matter either. That, okay, that's a good question. So do you need to know the specification ranges? I will say this. You do not need to memorize them or put them on your formula sheet. But it is very possible that I just include the table from ASTM C33, and then you must interpret that table. That, that is very possible. But I'm not going to make you memorize the, the or, or take up valuable space on your small little 8.5 by 11 sheet with stuff like that. So. Front and back. Again, um, I didn't throw this on the equipment, but I'll, I'll throw a, a brief addendum. If you want to bring in a scanning electron microscope and 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 write it, you know, at at you know 0 0.032 font, that's fine. You could just go right ahead. <laughs> Yes, yes. If you need the gradation charts or blending graphs or anything like that, they will be provided. You won't need to, to recreate that or, or uh, use that on your formula sheet. And, and I'll say it'll be either one of two things. It'll either be a separate sheet or it'll literally be on the test. So.
I mean, I mean, we can talk about it, but really, it's just whatever what was talked about in lecture one, like that. Whatever we talked about in lecture one, I mean, literally just p over a and and change in length over the original, like what we did on homework one. That, that's what I'm talking about with with two sixteen. So, you turn my phone down. I'm sorry about that. There are means to compute specific gravity of a portion of a stockpile as opposed to not without collecting the appropriate data. There, no. So I know I, I kind of get what you're asking with the course and fine. No. So you don't have to worry about that. So I missed something. I, I mean, there's no pressure like it's fluid mechanics. You, know? so you just got to relax with stuff like that. You know, find your meta center and just, you know. Did you like that? Find your meta center. Thank you. Have y'all gotten to that metacentric height stuff in fluids yet? Yeah, you will. It's about buoyancy and floating and whatnot. What's that? There you go. Okay, so it's only a test of the fire alarm system. <laughs> While you all are coming up with questions, I'm going to go ahead and pass out here. I'm just going to keep this simple. I'm going to give you the, those are the handouts for the lab today, and then you all can distribute them accordingly. I'm also going to go ahead and, and pass this around. So, um, I mean, just a little bit of a segue. I just wanted everybody to get a chance to, to look at this. This is a mortar cube. This is uh, uh, essentially what we're going to be casting today. So. Um, I'm still not 100% sure what I want to do, but um, uh, the idea is we're going to cast these, and then probably seven, you know, seven days later in lab, we'll probably go down to the lab and actually test these and give you a little bit of a flavor for the concrete testing that we're going to be doing uh, throughout the, uh, the semester. So I threw it in a Ziploc bag because it's a little dusty, and whatnot, although you're going to get a, a little more uh, dirty and whatnot in lab today because you're going to be casting these, but I figured I'd go ahead and just pass that around. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but. You can do like a seven-day test and then yep. a test thereafter for just the seven days. For this, for the mortar, just seven days. But when we do when we do actual concrete cylinders, we're going to do seven, 14, and 28. So. For two different mixes. So. What's this? What's that? That is outside our purview. It's, it's a mixer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, let's be clear, that's not on this exam. So I'm just passing it out now just to get it out, you know, before lab. So but again, this is your time. So I mean, any questions you have got on your uh, on your plate? Yes? Can you draw a stress strain curve on the formula sheet? That's fine. Because to me, that's just terms and definitions. I have no problem with that. That's fine too, because I I lump those for uh, in the uh, range of, of terms and concepts and definitions. I don't have any problem with that being on the on the formula sheet. But this is one of those things where you're going to do that. You're going to draw out this you know Rembrandt beautiful stress strain curve, and then when you get asked the problems on the exam, I bet you don't even look at it because it's in your head, you know. Basic stuff. I just want to make sure that you can do fundamentally basic statistics. Nothing, you know, if you can't compute the average of a few numbers, then, I mean, not getting into 
scores or student t tests or anything like that. No, no. Okay, you and you. You're one short. Did somebody take two? Now, anybody else take it? Is it just short? See, I, you know, I, I actually, I print off the exact number, so I knew everybody took one. Where's the uh, assignment? I passed, did I start it? We're in Huntington, <laughs> off of 3rd <laughs> Avenue, right? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't politics. This isn't politics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, all right, all right. Yes, sir. All right, hold, hold on. Hold on. Everybody needs to hear this. Go ahead. It's possible. It <laughs> and then it went back down. That is possible. Now, again, but but let me say this, okay? Again, in terms of time, I'm telling you this isn't a time cruncher exam. It, it's it's not, okay? The, on the homework. We, we, we do the one on the homework <laughs> and not the one. On <laughs> see, see, this is all whether or not you, you believe the poker face that I'm going to. There might be. There might not. Oh, I'll answer that. The test is already done. And I'm not changing it, so. <laughs> I need to practice my my uh, my comic book villain laugh, you know. Or, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can I can. <laughs> I don't I don't, I don't think I can handle it. I don't think I can, I can do that. I got a limit. <laughs> All right, hold on. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, homework one. Yes, yeah, I am recording, so. <laughs> All right, which which number was it? What problem number? That was a trade to me. Okay. So, hold on. Let me get my, my book. You all want me to go through this? Like, we can go through it in, in some, some somewhat significant detail. So, okay. All right. That's not what I wanted to open. Did every so everybody got a lab handout? All right. Number two, did everybody see the sign-in sheet, or get get to sign the sign-in sheet, or is it on its way? And three, okay. I think the mortar cubes made it all the way around. Okay. So, all right. This is twenty-one. You hear that too, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So 121. Okay. So we've got a stress strain curve looks something about like this. All right. And this is in megapascals. There we go. Okay. Now our stress strain curve looks something about like this. So we have 
that's the that's the fire alarm that they said to ignore. So. Okay. So this strain value was zero point zero zero three. What are the units on that? There are none. I mean, you could say meters per meters or inches per inches or light years per light years. It's unitless. Okay. This is 600 megapascals. Okay. And then we have another region like this. Okay. This goes up to 800 megapascals. And then this is, now I, I, I gave you that one. What did I say? It was what, 0 0.07. Is that what I said? It was something like that. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, before I even address the problem, I'm just going to do a couple things. So first off, what is that slope? Well, first off, what's it called? Young's modulus E. Okay. Now, um, we may or may not need it, but I'm going to go ahead and compute this one and call it the tangent modulus. You can call it whatever you want. Um, now, um, our Young's modulus is essentially going to be the slope of that, that initial line. And I propose the easiest way to determine that is to just take 600 megapascals divided by 0 0.003. Because, I mean, this is a line, just change in y over change in x. So what do we get here? Say that again. So 200,000 megapascals, is that right? 2 times 10 to the fifth? Yeah. Because I was going to do this. It's, you know, 200,000 megapa 200, megapascals or 200 gigapascals, whichever one you want to write. It doesn't matter. Okay. Now. The tangent modulus, how, how would we determine that? Well, it's essentially just change in y over change in x. So if you want, you can look at it as change in y, bless you, over, bless you, change in x, change in sigma over change in, in epsilon. There it goes again. All right. So change in y, uh, well, we have 200 megapascals. Does everybody see how I did that? I'll tell you what, if, if we want, we can, we can you know, re reduce the shorthand. Like we may or may not need these values, but I figure go ahead. And this is 0 0.07 minus 0 0.003. Okay, what do we got? Say it again. Point. Oh seven. Megapascals. Okay. Everybody okay with this? All right. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. All right. Now, question one says, okay. If this bar, or the part, first part says, if this bar uh, made of this material is subjected to a stress of 650 megapascals and then released, what is the permanent strain? Okay. What? You hit all. Oh. I thought somebody said no. Like, <laughs> like it's what it says. Like, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, all right. So uh, essentially what we're talking about is this. We're talking about um, a point on the curve somewhere about like this. Would you agree with that? Like 650 megapascals. It's probably right here, so we're talking about this point. Everybody okay with that? All right, so how about this? Um, would you agree that this point like, let's just keep this simple. All right. This point is 
800, or sorry, x and y. This point is 0 0.07 comma 800. Everybody okay with that? This point here is 0 0.003 comma 600. They are testing that alarm <laughs> system. They're turning the heat up in there, I'm going to tell you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And for those of you that have had thermo, and the cycle continues. Nobody, has anybody had thermo? Cycles? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, all right. So the first thing that we need uh, on this particular curve is we need to know, okay, so you would agree that the Y coordinate here is going to be 650, but you don't know what that is, right? Okay, let's just keep this simple, okay? Let's look at this line, okay? For that, that second portion of the curve, so I'll say second portion of the curve, Second portion of the curve, would you agree that if, if you want to use x's and y's, so we have x1 is 0 0.003, y1 is 600, what's the slope? Well, it's this, which is 2985.07, remember this? Remember that? Point slope formula. So y minus 600 equals 2985.07. And then it's x minus, is it 0 0.03? Oh, heck, I put decimal there. I promise I did. 0 0.003. So y minus 600 equals what? 2985.07x minus what? Say it again. 591.04. Right? So if I add 600. Oh, so. This is just y, like that. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so if I'm searching for the x value when y is 650, so what do we have? We've got, hold on, I'll just do, all right, that's gonna bug me. That's the best you're going to get. <laughs> We're moving on. <laughs> okay. All right. So we need to determine the x coordinate. So if I plug in a y value of, we'll say, 650 equals 2985.07x plus 591.04, therefore x is... 650 minus 591.04 divided by 2985.07. What do we get? 0 0.0198. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? what's going to be linear? No, no, it, that, that's a function of what material we're looking at. Like in this particular problem, we're looking at, and they don't even really describe it, they just describe some elastoplastic material that has a stress strain curve looking something like this. Let me qualify by saying this. If we were dealing with concrete, 
this would be a stress strain curve that would be highly nonlinear. The stress strain curve, it would be curved, okay? But if we're talking about metallic alloys and stuff like that, it's, it's a fairly safe assumption to say you're usually going to have some linear elastic range over here and then some plateau past that. That's, that's very common. Um, but if, depending upon the material, very possibly does not have a, a linear stress strain curve. Concretes won't. Um, you know, things like rubbers, the rubber type materials, they don't. So it, it just depends on the material that you're looking at. But a further point is stress strain curves are unique to a given material, which is why they're so valuable. You know, this stress strain curve for this, you know, a lot, let's call it some alloy, like alloy A, that stress strain curve for alloy A applies to anything that is constructed of alloy A, regardless of size or dimension or anything like that. That's, that's sort of why they're so valuable. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah, if, if not, uh-oh, that would mean breaking out, make, breaking out the calculus. This isn't calculus, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. This isn't calculus. Okay, you okay with this? So would you agree, would you agree that this is 0 0.01986,650? 0 do you agree with that? Okay, all right. Now let, let's continue, okay? Now the, it says the bar that's made of this material, it's subjected to a stress of 650 megapascals, okay? It's subjected to a stress of 650 megapascals. It's loaded and it reaches this range. Then what happens? It says it's released. Now, Fundamental material behavior says that if you get to the point where it yields something, you got some stress on it, and you let it go, it unloads, but it unloads at the elastic modulus. Make sense? So, if I unload this, and my scale's horrible, don't, don't trust the scale. But I'm unloading it. It's going to be something about like this. Would you agree? Don't, don't trust the scale. It could be before or after this point. Just bear with me on that. Everybody okay with this? So the question is asking, okay, what is the permanent strain? The permanent strain is essentially whatever this is. Make sense? Because that's the strain that's locked into it. So I propose it's just another point slope formula, okay? So I'll say reloading curve. Okay. So what do we know about this blue dotted line? Okay. We know a point on that curve. What else do we know? The slope. And the slope of that curve is, is E, so it's 200, E, so it's 200,000. So M is E, which is 200,000. Same thing all over again. So Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. So Y minus 650 equals 200,000. X minus 0 0.0198. So Y minus 650, well here. Y equals 200,000 X and what? You tell. Say it again. Minus 3350. Do I have a second on that? Everybody okay with that? All right, so that's the equation for this line. We can use that to determine information about this point. What do we know about that point? We know that y equals zero, we're looking for this. So if I say zero equals 200,000 x 
plus or minus 3350. What do we got? Make sense? Now, an easy way of doing that is just to take off the 0 0.003, but I'm trying to you know, keep this simple, okay? Well, the 0 0.003 up here on the graph, that was the strain when it yielded. So you can subtract that off, but, uh, but what I'm trying to do is show you a little bit more of a generalized approach that would work across the board. Point slope formula, I think, is the easiest way to look at that. Does that make sense? So, okay, so they got point oh one six five, probably just rounding, what have you. So, yeah, we got point oh one six eight. They got point oh one six five, probably just rounding. Is there are there any questions on that? That was over a second. <laughs> well, that's part C. We're just looking at part A. You see what I mean? Here, here. Part A, look. Part A is asking, okay, if the bar is made, uh, okay, if the bar is subjected to a stress of 650 megapascals and then is unloaded, what's the permanent strain, okay? This term right here, like right here, this is just the answer to part A, okay? Now, now part C asks if the material is, is now, like once it's been released and it's got this permanent strain, if the material is subjected to a stress of 625, part C is saying, okay, for this line, if I go up to 625, that puts me about right here. So what's the strain when this is 625? Whoop, 625. And this is just using the same equation we just derived. You know, here's the, the, the line. There's the curve. We know the y coordinate. Solve for x. There you go. Does that, does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? If you want to, if the, the, the point I'm making is if the, the stress strain formulas and whatnot are getting to you, a line, point slope formula. That's all this is. Okay? Just keep it straightforward. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> so you got like the, so you said that this was your answer, the point oh one nine eight. That's the total strain. That's not the permanent strain, though. I'm saying, like, once it's reloaded, we found that, like, the strain in the reload was uh, 0.0. I think I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I don't understand what you're saying. Yes, that is correct. I, I, I could understand that, and, and probably, the, in my opinion, the problem could be reworded a little bit. If I was writing the problem, what I would have said is, after strain hardening, how much additional strain would 625 megapascals cause? That's how I would have worded it. Okay, and in that in that wording, the answer is in fact zero point zero three one two five. 
I get what you're saying, and, and it's, I think it's a little bit debatable, but I think the main purpose of this particular problem was saying, okay, once I load it, unload it, and I get that permanent deformation, if I load it to 625, it is only going to respond elastically. I think that was the point of the problem. Do, do you see what I mean? I agree. I think the wording could have been tweaked a little bit, but in the end, I think, I think even looking at the behavior, it's pretty clear that the point is saying that this is elastic. The only plastic behavior in this particular problem was from the first loading, not the second. Like when it was first subjected to 650. Right. What's that? What? Okay. All right. Any other questions about this particular problem? I don't want to spend the entire review session on one problem, but I think this was important because I don't think you all were the ones that just had this question on this. I think there's probably a few, a few of you that had questions on it. And that's fine. Let me, let me tell you about these review sessions. Okay? You know, and I've, I've given review sessions like this before, and I know that there's a point when some folks might be a little nervous about asking a given question. Let me tell you what happens. As soon as somebody raises their hand and they say, I've got a question about this, and it's that one question that they might have been nervous to ask, now, everybody else in the room gives me this look like, yeah, we wanted that question asked too, but we, we didn't want to ask it ourselves. We were just waiting for somebody, somebody else to ask it. All right? So don't be afraid. I mean, ask whatever you want. I mean, uh, again, this is your time to, if there's anything that's confusing you, anything that you're concerned about, this is the time. So please, ask anything. Ask away. You are welcome. Forty-two. That was an easy one. We're figuring that one out, right? We're figuring that one out. <laughs> All right. Um, seriously, any other questions about aggregates? About any of this stuff? No, no. So in part C, you know, the, the, uh, on part C, it has you do it at 625, right? Yes, on the reloading curve, yes. Uh, what if it went above 610? Then it would follow the, the it would follow this curve. The the one the red uh, uh, this one right here uh, that one yeah. yes okay. yeah because it's 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 still the same line yes same slope so it would that it would fracture and then. It's literally two pieces, so it it just falls down. <laughs> Period. Now, let, let me also say is, if you were to do something like this, you know, hundreds and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, you're getting into the world of fatigue, and that is a characterization in and of itself. That's a whole another topic. So, but fatigue considerations be are they they in our world they matter uh, when we're assessing highway bridges. Particularly, what, what ends up happening is you take your fatigue loading on a given bridge and you compare it against the resistance for a given detail. So to keep it simple, like bolted connections would have a different fatigue threshold than welded connections. And stiffeners are going to behave differently than splices and stuff like that. So depending upon your connection and the detail that you're looking at, you look it up and say, okay, my fatigue threshold is 12 KSI. Does that compare against what it's actually seen? So. And you basically, the way, the way that you determine what it's seeing is you take your fatigue truck and then it's a function of how many cycles it's seeing. So 365 days a year, we design bridges for 75-year design lives, then multiply that times, okay, depending on what road it is, what's the average daily traffic, how much of that traffic is truck traffic, and how much of that occurs in a single lane and go from there. So it's not hard, it's just a process. So. What's that? It's just Ashta, yeah. Yeah. 
You're welcome. Anything, anything. Okay, um, all right, this, this is what I'm gonna do. I do this every, at, with every exam review session. Are you good? You good? I'm still processing that one. <laughs> you good? You good? 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 Okay, all right. Okay, it is, let's do this. I, I'm, I'm going to contact uh, Patrick. It's about 127. Let's plan to just meet back here in 15 minutes. We'll say 145, okay? Sound good? All right, let's take a break and we'll get ready for lab.